I want to plunge into uh, tonight's teaching. He's alive. But I don't want to plunge into the Word without having a prayer with you. So let's pray. Dear God, Thursday camp meeting. We've been inspired, energized, thought processes percolating. Thanks to the Holy Spirit. Could we do this back at our church? Couldn't, why couldn't we? Why couldn't this be us? Thank you for these testimonies. We'll hear more of them tomorrow on Sabbath, I'm sure, but it's all about healing. That's what you've shown us. The most precious possess, possession we as humans cling to. The only treasure of earth that we will take to heaven. Relationships. Our character. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing else goes with us. And so as we think about healing tonight, oh, this, is, this is a radical teaching, dear Father. May the truth of this teaching embedded in the life of that young man somehow interface with where we are. Do your miracle in us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I have here in the uh, pulpit a poem written by a girl named Leah. She wrote this poem, 2008, posted it on the internet upon the death of her mother. The title of Leah's poem, The Unhealing Wound. Let me read it to you. There is this wound, it hurts so bad, it always appears when I am sad. No matter what I do, it won't go away. It's in my heart where it will always stay. It appeared the day you left this world, and I was no longer your little girl. Forced to grow up with you not there, to make things easy that I couldn't bear. I search for you every day. If I'm sick, sad, or just have something to say, I'm jealous of some girls, girls who still have their mothers. I tell them to appreciate what they have because after they are gone, there simply are no others. I have this pain that won't go away. It makes me mad that you couldn't stay. No matter how many years go by, there's still one time of day that I do cry. I miss you dearly, and this is true. My wound will not heal till I'm with you. Mm. Young Leah, the death of her mother. Two years after this poem was written, another girl named Megan went to the website of Leah's poem and posted these words. This is Megan writing now. My best friend's mother was killed by a drunk driver. She was the awesomest person ever. She was like my second mom now I have no one to call at 3 o'clock in the morning to ask if everything's going to be okay. Then about two weeks ago, my friend took her life. She was raped. She couldn't take the pain. I was there when she took her life. I saw the pain in her eyes as I tried to save her, but it was too late. Now she's gone. And one day I will be too, but not soon. I have too much ahead of me. But I will always live with the pain of losing loved ones kind of endemic to life on this planet, isn't it? This pain of, of losing loved ones. Is there anybody here that is a stranger to this pain? I will always live with the pain of losing loved ones, the raw pain embedded in the twin tales of, of Joseph and Jesus. We noted last night Wow, they really are alike. That realization will only grow stronger right through to the end. Pain embedded in the loss of loved ones. First sto story of Joseph. Open your Bible. Open your Bible to Genesis chapter 37. We'll pick it right up where we left off last evening. And I'm hoping some of you are taking some worship time in your private devotions here. We've, they've got a huge, busy... Very productive and uh, refreshing, revitalizing schedule planned for us at camping. All these seminars, man, you got some great seminars going on. But somewhere in the day, maybe some quiet time, and, and I hope some of you are saying, Ooh, I think I could find some of these Joseph Jesus parallels. I found 25 of them just like that reading it. Told you there's a website, 250 of them. 
Let's start with the Joseph story. The pain of losing loved ones. <laughs> writ, writ large in this beloved narrative of Holy Scripture. I'll pick it up uh, here in verse 31. This is Genesis 37. Pick it up where we left off last night. Then they, that would be his brothers. Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father, and they said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it. Father Jacob, he recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Because we will always live with the pain of losing a loved one, that's why. Pain, the word seems terribly inadequate to describe the stunned emotion of one who has just learned of the death of his dearest in this life. I've had to stand there in that little village because the policeman called me up and he said, hey, pastor, I need you to go with me on this visit. I've stood on the doorstep of a man who is about to learn that the dearest relationship in this world to him, his wife who left just a few moments ago, to go shopping, Christmas shopping down in South Bend. I was killed in a car accident. And I'm going to fumble for words on that doorstep knowing that these words will forever radically rewrite the existence of this gentleman. The pain of losing loved ones. There is not a soul here. Oh, there are a few. You're too young yet to know that pain. It's okay. Live a few years. You'll catch up to the rest of us. You'll catch up. You will. The pain of losing a loved one. Jacob clutches this bloody coat of many colors. The blood brown and coagulated now. It's been a long, long, painful. Step by step, their guilt only heightening journey for those boys who have sold their kid brother, forever gone into slavery. The torture of every step bringing us nearer and closer to daddy. Jacob clutches the coagulated, bloody garment, bursts into tears. It's Joseph's. It's Joseph's. I mean, there was not like, there wasn't an advance party that came and said, oh, by the way, you're going to get some bad news in about 15 minutes. Like the man on the doorstep, you know nothing. You just go to the door. Ding dong. Hi, we're here to tell you your wife was just killed. That's what Jacob got. Ding dong. Hey, is this your son's? Not, not our brother's. Is this your son's coat? Wanted to make sure, just in case. And the dad bursts into tears. There's some of you dads who are here who know exactly of what I describe. There's some of you moms here who know precisely the knife edge of the pain of losing a child. There is no greater pain. There is no greater pain in the human race. I've been a pastor for just a few years, but there is no greater pain that a human can endure than for a parent to lose a young child. It's, it's you know, you know. Perhaps it was John Boy, I don't know. John Boy came sobbing back into that suffocating upper room, confused and heartbroken, the remnant of the disciples huddled for fear. John Boy, the youngest, 18, 19, what was he, maybe 20? Burst through that door, sobbing. He's dead. I'm telling you, he's dead. I saw him die. John, boy, he'll grow old and then write the story. We're tracking the two tales of Joseph and Jesus. And so let's go to Jesus. Very much alike, these two. Let's go to John 19. 
John, boy, the only, the only eyewitness of the disciples, the only. Matthew, Mark, and Luke written by people who weren't there. Only John, boy, was there. Saw it with his 20-year-old eyes. John chapter 19. Let's pick it up in verse uh, 32. The priests, furious, and afraid that even in death this Nazarene might still vanquish them. Wanting to, get the, wanting to get the bodies off the cross before the Sabbath begins. Can you believe that? I mean, there's some people who have the day of the Sabbath down to a T. When any argument in town over which day of the week is the seventh day. There's some people who have the day of the Sabbath embedded in their DNA. They just don't know the Lord of the Sabbath yet. It was the Pharisees. They had the day. Get the bodies down. Sun's setting. Come on, clean up the evidence. Let's go. They sent the word to the governor, and the governor also culpable as he is, get the evidence out before we have a riot. So the governor gives the command, and the Roman guard come. What is this? Verse, 30, verse uh, 32. And so the soldiers therefore came, and they broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and those of the other. Barbaric execution. Barbaric Excruciating. In fact, the, the word excruciating that we use is the Latin excruciatus, and it means X from crux, cross, from out of the cross. The next time you say, I have an excruciating headache, you say, my pain's from out of the cross. That's what you're saying. Barbaric form of execution designed to suffocate you. You will drown in your own fluids. You are now struggling at this hour, six hours. You are struggling to, to raise your body up on that pinned, on, on your pinned wrists, producing searing pain as you push the weight against the, your, the, the ankles that have been nailed. You suck that air and you drop yourself down. But when they shatter your shins, the pain is just too much. You quit breathing, you drown in your own fluids. Get them off the cross. Kill them. Crush the shins. Crush the shins. The soldier comes to the man on the middle cross. About ready to strike. Whoa! The centurion says, whoa, he's dead. Amazing. Dead at six, in six hours. But just to be sure, the captain comes stomping over, and with that spear, right through the Ribcage, not a movement, not a flicker. He's dead. And John Boy, who's standing there. Why am I telling you this? I'm supposed to be reading it. <laughs> okay, so verse 33. <laughs> but when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they, not, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And John Boy, who's standing there, Eyewitness, when he later would pick up that quill and ink this parchment called the fourth gospel, he would make sure that the gospel would begin with liquid clear and red and that it would end with liquid clear and red, two liquids. Water turned to wine in the beginning and death turned to life in the ending. This is a John boy who saw it. Verse 34. The blood and water, sudden flow. Verse 35. And the man who saw this has given testimony. His testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you may believe. Now drop down. Here's where I want to go. I'll drop down to verse 38. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a, sh a 
a, a secret disciple of Jesus, secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. But with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. Verse 39, he was accompanied by, oh my, the midnight visitant himself, Nicodemus, the other Pharisee. A man who earlier had visited Jesus at night, Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, and taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in the strips of linen. This was in, in accordance with the Jewish burial customs. Desire of Ages draws this veil aside to remind us John Boy was there. We already know, but watch this. I'm going to put Desire of Ages on the screen for you. Gently and reverently. You can picture this. Gently and reverently, they removed with their own hands the body of Jesus from the cross. Their tears of sympathy fell fast as they looked upon his bruised and lacerated form. Joseph owned a new tomb hewn in a rock. This, this he was reserving for himself, but it was near Calvary, and he now prepared it for Jesus. The body, together with the spices brought by Nicodemus, was carefully wrapped in a linen sheet, and the Redeemer was born, carried from the tomb. There the three disciples. Wait a minute. There are only two, Joseph and Nicodemus. No, there are three. John Boy is in that group. Those were his tears falling on that lacerated, lifeless corpse. There the three disciples straightened the mangled limbs and folded the bruised, ha bruised hands upon the pulseless breast, end quote. We forget, or perhaps it never occurs to us, how tender the ties were between Jesus and his, his inner circle. I mean, they, they, they lived together. They laughed together. They ate together. They wept together. They prayed together. Intermittently, for three and a half years, they've been like this. This is not just another relationship. This is the one they had believed was the Messiah sent from God. He was their BFF. Do you know what BFF stands for, Facebookers? Best friend forever or best forever friend. Jesus was their BFF. This is not some sort of sterile little funeral procedure. Let's, 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 let's get everything tidied up here and uh, last rites pronounced. The tears fell on the mangled form of the one we had trusted was He. The truth is, and here's the point, because this little mini-series is about relationships. Death is the great terminator of relationships. Death is the great terminator of relationships. The one possession that we take from this life to the next someday. Relationships, that and character. Death is the great terminator of what you hold most precious to your heart. If nothing else gets her, if nothing else gets him, if no one else gets her or him, death will. You or her, you or him, you or them. Death is a great terminator. Doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor. Doesn't matter whether you're black or white. Gay or straight, literate or illiterate, first world, third world, doesn't matter. Relationships are what matter. And death is the great terminator. You are, how did that, how did that uh, old song go? You are dead and gone forever. Oh, my darling, Clementine. Not a real great piece of literature to be quoting at a camp meeting, I understand. <laughs> so let me hasten, let me hasten to read something a little more classical and dignified for such an august assemblage as this one. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote this. Powerfully captures the loss of the dearest on earth in life. It's entitled The Cross of Snow. Longfellow wrote it 18 years after the love of his life, his wife, perished. A candle fell over 
in their home. Her gown caught fire. He tried to put it out, scarred his face, lost his wife. That's why, by the way, he never shaved again. Scarred face, that unusual beard of his. That's because she's dead. Eighteen years later, the pain. Don't you tell me that pain goes away. Eighteen years later. The cross of snow... In the long sleepless watches of the night, a gentle face, the face of one long dead, looks at me from the wall where around its head the night lamp casts a halo of pale light. Here in this room she died, and soul more white never through martyrdom of fire was led to its repose, nor can in books be read the legend of a life more being benedite. There is a mountain in the distant west that sun defying in its deep ravines displays a cross of snow upon its side. Such is the cross I wear upon my breast these 18 years through all the changing scenes and seasons, changeless since the day she died. 18 years later, you don't get over it. What am I, why am I telling you? You know it's true, don't you? the most precious possession a human being can embrace. Death, the great terminator, gone, gone forever. So it feels. Stunning truth about both Joseph and Jesus. However, is that both stories do not end in death. Praise God. Both stories. Watch this. Now, we got to advance. We've got to hit the fast forward on this little uh, DVD. Psh, fast forward. We're going to cover it. Ooh, what tomorrow night? We'll, co- we'll skip over that. What Sabbath morning? Ooh, skip over that. But we need to see this. 25 years of dragged by, if you're the brothers flown by if you're Joseph. Let's go. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 45, verse 25. Put the words on the screen for you. Genesis 45, 25. So they, the brothers, went up out of Egypt. Guess what? They've just found out who the boy is. The second highest in the Egyptian empire. They just found out. They just found out. And that motive, that, that, that meeting, ooh, Sabbath morning, don't miss it. They just found out. And so they went up out of Egypt, and they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. This, this, This had to be the greatest, best news announcement in the world that was the hardest ever in human history to tell. Right? We have wonderful news for you, Daddy. But now it's, do you swear to tell the truth, all the truth, and nothing but the truth? We do. This is going to be bad. You you have to tell. By the way, if you think you're getting out of having to tell, Because somebody disappeared, got off the scene, and I don't have to deal with that anymore. You get to heaven. There'll be a thousand years for you to work up your courage to tell. A thousand years. Because God says we're not going into the new earth with chapters still open. We're going to close every book in these thousand years. She wasn't around for you to tell. She'll be there, God says, because I'm making sure she's going to be there. And if you want me, you'll be there. And so, David, you have something to say to Uriah. Because he's going to be there. He's in the Messiah's genealogy. He's going to be there. So don't think that you can just throw a relationship aside and I'll move on to the next one please. Can't. You have too much invested now. They have a long journey home one more time. 
And so, there it is. Verse 25, let's read it again. So they went up out of Egypt, and they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. Here we go. Next verse. We'll just keep reading. They told him. This is the sons now. They're all 11 sons. Little Benny was with them this time. All 11. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, Papa, he is ruler of all Egypt. And Jacob, Jacob just collapses where he was standing. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. Would you believe? I've had to stand there when the announcement is made that your beloved is dead. It's awful. But I have never had the privilege of standing there when the announcement is made your beloved has been resurrected and is alive. Can you imagine? That's what's happening here. Somebody's come back from the grave. Keep reading. Jacob did not believe. Keep reading. Let's get that next slide up. They told Jacob, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he's ruler of all Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He didn't believe. Now we'll go to that next one. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when Jacob saw the carts laden with the treasures of Egypt that Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I am convinced. I am, I am convinced my son Joseph is still alive, and I will go and see him before I die. He's alive. Twin stories. Same story, isn't that right? Same story. Quick, back to John 20. John 20. Your Bible was still open to that, maybe? John 20, verse 1, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. There's a gaping hole there now. Something's happened. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. That would be John Boy. He, only, he never identifies himself by name, ever, 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 ever. Not in the gospel. I'm the one. He, he says this in, in humility because it, in the Greek it reads, he's the one Jesus kept on loving. He's not boasting. He just kept on loving me. Code language for John boy. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So, verse 3, Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Hey, John, boy, I want to get all kind of cocky over this thing that you're so young you got to the tomb first. Now, why are you picking on Peter for this? Well, he just wanted you to know he beat Peter to the tomb. That's all. Well, he didn't say he was perfect. <laughs> Both are running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb because that's Peter. No fear, Peter. I'm in here. What's up? And he went straight in to the tomb, he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. If it had been grave robbers, they would have stripped everything off, thrown it in a heap in the corner, walked off with the body with all the, the, the linen. They would not have folded it up nicely. Not if you're a grave robber. you got to do this fast. Something's happened. That's why John includes that detail. Something has happened here. Somebody folded the garments of death as if he had authority over death himself. Folds the grave clothes. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first. Okay, John, we got it the first time. <laughs> I went running this morning, ran around the little Uthawa church and ran down, you know, do my three miles. The older you get, the slower you get. I mean, we all know that. So. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Boom! I know what happened. Peter's still scratching his head. What's up with this? 
John Boy goes in and says, I know what happened. He saw and believed, verse 9, but they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus was to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Yep, that's it. Please note, ladies and gentlemen, that neither Jacob regarding Joseph nor the disciples regarding Jesus, none has seen the dead one. They are all having to trust circumstantial evidence. Is that not right? None has seen the dead one, the deceased. But on the basis of circumstantial evidence, both Jacob and John believe he's alive. He has got to be alive. And soon enough, as both stories reveal, they will gaze upon him whom they have loved so deeply. He's changed. Joseph has changed, but he's still Joseph. Jesus has changed, but he's still the same Jesus. Desire of Ages, put it on the screen, please. The resurrection of Jesus was a type. I like that. It's a, it just means a dress, rehearsal, a dress rehearsal. The resurrection of Jesus was a type of the final resurrection of all who sleep in him. Hallelujah. The countenance of the risen Savior, his manner of speech were all familiar to the disciples. There's not, there's not some kind of guessing game going on here. They know this was the one who was dead. He's alive when they see him. Now, it's true, according to, chap- according to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, psh, when Jesus walks into the upper room, they go berserk. They are convinced it is a ghost. An apparition from the grave has come to torment us. Jesus says, guys, calm down, calm down. It's me. It's me. Come here, come here, come here, touch me. <laughs> do, do, ghosts, do ghosts have flesh and do you have any food here? You got some fish and bread? I'll eat it. I'll show you. Ghosts don't eat. They bring in the food. And then Luke says they were overjoyed. John does the same thing. Look at John. Let's put John up on the screen. Verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Some people say, oh, that's the first Sunday service. There they have it. Sunday evening service. Nope. They're not having any worship praise service here. Are you kidding? They're there. They're scared spitless. They're only in that upper room because they're fraidy cats. And the doors are locked. Because they're convinced that the ones who went after their master will be coming after them next. There's no worship service going on here. While they were in in that room, for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. There he is. The same Jesus. Look at that next verse. And Jesus said, Shalom, peace be with you. Somebody was just up here on this platform talking about shalom, weren't they? Wasn't there somebody on there a moment ago? Was that Fulbright? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Shalom. Peace. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. This whole thing is happening. They, 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 they see him, but they don't see him. And now when he shows them, now they, they realize it is he. Now, the Desire of Ages quote that we interrupted for a moment goes on, and it's choice. I want you to see this. Put it on the screen, please. Somebody's saying, come on, where's that, where's that study guide that you promised? Tonight, you don't need a study guide. This, th- there's only one big idea, and you, you'll get it by the end. You'll get it by the end. You don't need a study guide to reinforce a thing. You have your own Desire of Ages. Jot the page number down if you want. So, going on, as Jesus rose from the dead, so those who sleep in him are to rise again. We shall know our friends even as the disciples knew Jesus. Now keep reading. They may have been deformed when they died. They may have been diseased when they died. They may have been disfigured when they died in this mortal life. But they rise in perfect health and symmetry. Wow. Yet in the glorified body, their identity will be perfectly preserved. Then we shall know even as also we are known, 1 Corinthians 13. Last line, in the face radiant. Oh, I love this. In the face radiant with the light shining from the face of Jesus. Where does the light come from? The resurrected. Where are they going to get the light from? It's the light shining in the face of Jesus with faces radiant. 
With the light shining from the face of Jesus, we shall recognize the lineaments. That means the distinctive faces of those we love. Did you catch what we just read? Let me repeat it to you. We shall know our friends and those we love. When death, the great terminator of relationships, shall be destroyed, we shall know our friends and those we loved. Hallelujah and amen. Death is a great terminator only for a season. But there is one who sits upon the throne of the universe who has promised us, I will have the last word. And when I speak, it will be a word of life forever and ever. Amen. Wow. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, by the way. That is the promise that our most prized and our, our most precious possessions one day by His grace shall be restored unto us. I was in Brazil this last week lecturing on a beautiful college campus in South Brazil. As I told you about last night. 125 theology majors. So this is theology week, they call it. And they bring people in to just teach these, and I just love working with these undergrads. It's so full of life and energy and vision. I teach at the seminary. Life changes by the time you reach the seminary. You realize the realities of life and ministry, and that's a good thing. I love teaching at the seminary. But these, I don't know how it came up because I wasn't lecturing on this but somehow death came up, and I said, hey, guys, I need to tell you this. And, of course, there's a, my, my, my good friend, Marcio Costa, uh, academic dean there, and a, Andrew's grad, one of the professors, he's translating in Portuguese. So anyway, I said, hey, guys, I need, I, I need to remind you that when you die, and if Jesus doesn't come soon enough, and we don't live long enough, we'll die, right? Yeah, when you die, I need you to know there's nothing to be afraid of. I need you to know, just remind you, that death is like this. When you die, your eyes close. When Jesus comes, they open. But the space of time for death for you is... For you, it's... I said, guys, I want you to do that in Portuguese. <laughs> and a whole auditorium. <laughs> you got it. That's the truth about death. <laughs> we don't mourn for the dead. <laughs> we always mourn for the living, for ourselves. I have to go on without you. <laughs> Isn't that right? I tell you what, the truth about death as recorded in Holy Scripture, is the most comforting, it is the most satisfying, it is the most philosophically logical teaching about death on the entire planet, bar none. Because God tells the truth. Jesus said, Lazarus is sleeping. He's sleeping. It's okay. He's asleep. But I go that I may wake him out of that sleep. For I am, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. She who believes in me, though she dies, yet shall she live. For because I live, you shall live. How's it go? You shall live also. It's the truth about death. The great terminator of relationships, gone. Just like that, gone. We have hope. We have hope. But here's the question before you hurry out of here. Here's the question I need to ask you. These relationships that will be restored one day, after death? Here's the question. Can they be restored this side of death? 
Can they be restored this side of death while you're still alive and she is and he is and they are? Can they be restored by the same God who says, I am the resurrection and the life. You believe in me, I can do it. Can they be restored? That's the question. Put it another way, do you suppose the power of the risen Christ could also resurrect a deceased relationship in this life? Can the power of His grace and love resurrect a friendship, a marriage, a family now in this life? Can He do it? He can do it. Jesus says, hey, listen, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Of course I can do it. I can do this. Dead, lifeless, not a pulse in that corpse of a relationship. But if you want life, if you want healing, and I know it takes two, but if you want it, I'll give it to you. I will give it to you. This is the Christ, the Jesus that matches Joseph. This is the power of the risen Christ that can restore any broken relationship on this planet. That's what he did with Joseph and his brothers. It took 25 years to do it, but he restored it. You got a problem with that? He did it. He restored their relationship. So what's wrong with that? That's what he did with Hosea and his adulterous wife, Gomer took the repeated forgivenesses of Hosea on behalf of Gomer, but finally he restored that marriage. He can do it. That's what he did with the prodigal father who never gave up on his runaway boy, never gave up till the boy came home. He can do it. That's what he did with broken-hearted Peter, forgave him of his brutal denials, his cursing, the very name of his BFF. That's what he did. He said, I can heal that. Don't you suppose that the risen Christ can heal the most broken relationship you and I are pained over tonight? Now listen, listen. Don't come up to me afterwards and set me straight because I know what you're thinking. Of course, I already made this point, but I repeat it. It takes two. It takes two, I understand that, but if one hangs on, the one can become, become the healing of the two if the two are willing to become one again. That's the point. He said, Dwight, I'm just too beaten up. I can't go back. I'm too tired. I understand. And sometimes you can't go back. But I just need you to be sure that it's not because you want an out and don't want to go back. Because if you want a relationship and the second wants a relationship, there's someone in this universe tonight that can begin to heal that relationship. I want to read a story to you. Scott and Sherry Jennings. They wrote it up. Listen to this. This is a couple. In 2005, we had every reason in the world to believe our marriage was over. My husband Scott was living with another woman, and I could see no indication that he would ever turn his heart back to our marriage and family. Everyone had advice to offer me, kick him to the curb, move on, you deserve better, girl. But God also placed two strong women in my life. Oh, I love this s'mores. God placed two strong women in my life. God bless strong women. And they encouraged me with the truth. I should love and respect my husband unconditionally honoring the covenant I made with God. They told me as long as you're breathing, there's hope. In September of 2005, on the day of our 14th wedding anniversary, we divorced. Can you imagine that? Three days later, Christ invaded Scott's heart, and we remarried each other after a period. She does not say how long. 
after a period of reconciliation. Healing takes time. Today we like to tell people our divorce just didn't work out. <laughs> Isn't that good? That's worth it for all that one, that one little line. That one little line. You know what? Our divorce just didn't work out. I'm sorry. It didn't work out. We thought it would. It didn't work out. What can you say? We're married again. Yet the truth is that we decided to intentionally pursue God and each other, and it worked. We find ourselves asking, if no one tells couples, how will they know that as long as they are breathing, there is hope for their marriage? Where there is life, there is hope tonight. There is hope. Look it. I know the circumstances for you are different. I understand that. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not minimizing the immense pain and the suffering that you've been put through by somebody else's heartless decision. I'm not minimizing that at all. But if life is about healing of relationships, and Jesus is coming soon as the theme of this camp meeting keeps reminding us, then the healing has to start now. Come on. It has to start now. If they're still around and possible, I understand doors can close. There's no going back. Don't even look back. You're right. Get on. Get on. But, see, I'm not willing to throw that little caveat out. I'm not willing to allow that caveat to just diminish the power of the resurrected Christ. Where there's life, it's really true. There is hope. But the good news of the teaching of Jesus and Joseph, the good news is even better than that. For even when there is no life, there is still hope. Amen. I want to end with a story. A story uh, written by Lauren Isley, the great anthropologist writer. Oh, if you can find anything by Lauren Isley. He's just a masterful writer. I close with a story. Let me give you a little background to it. Lauren Isley was on an expedition to capture birds, reptiles for a zoo. So he went up into the mountains and said, I'm going to catch some birds, wild birds. He found a cabin up in the hills, unoccupied for years. The cabin had holes in it, and there were holes in the roof. And he said, I'll bet you there are birds inside this cabin. And so he put a ladder up inside the cabin against one of the beams. And with a flashlight ready, he's going to catch it. The flashlight ready to blind the birds. He crept up until head and arms were up over the shelf. Now he picks it up right here. I snapped on the, flash, on the flash, and sure enough, there was a great beating and feathers flying, but instead of my having them, they, or rather he, had me. He had my hand, that is, and for a small hawk not much bigger than my fist, he was doing all right. I heard him give one short metallic cry when the light went on. And my hand descended on the bird beside him. But after that, he was busy with his claws and his beak stuck in my thumb. He was a sparrow hawk and a fine young male in the prime of life. I was sorry not to catch the pair of them, but as I dripped blood and folded his wings carefully, holding him by the back so that he wouldn't strike again, I had to admit that the two of them might have been more than I could have handled under the circumstances. <laughs> the little fellow had saved his mate by diverting me. And that was that. He was born to it and made no outcry now, resting in my hand hopelessly, but peering toward me in the shadows behind the lamp with a fierce, almost indifferent glance. He neither gave nor expected mercy, and something out of the high air passed from him to me, stirring a faint embarrassment. Isley puts the small bird in a box for the night. Next morning, he brings a box out onto the grass, preparing to make a cage. He looked up into the deep blue sky. I wonder if she's around. No, no, she's not. Obviously gone by now. Then on impulse, Isley took the bird out of the box. Now here he, he picks up the writing now. He lay limp in my grasp. And I could feel his heart pound under the feathers, but he only looked beyond me and up, and I saw him look, look that last look away beyond me into a sky so full of light that I could not follow his gaze. 
I suppose I must have had an idea then of what I was going to do, but I never let it come into consciousness. I just reached over and laid the hawk on the grass. He lay there for a long minute without hope, unmoving, his eyes still fixed on that blue vault above him. It must have been that he was already so far away in heart that he never felt the release from my hand. He never even stood. He just lay with his breast against the grass. In the next second after that long minute, he's gone. Like a flicker of light. He'd vanished from my eyes full on him, but without actually seeing even a premonitory wing beat. He was gone straight into that towering emptiness of light and crystal that my eyes could scarcely bear to penetrate. For a long moment there was silence. I could not see him. The light was, was too intense. Then from far up somewhere a cry came ringing down. I was young then. And it seemed little of the world, but when I heard that cry, my heart turned over. It was not the cry of the hawk I had captured. For by shifting my position against the sun, I was now seeing further up, straight out of the sun's eye, where she must have been soaring restlessly above us for untold hours. Hurdle his mate. I saw them both now. He was rising to meet her. And from far up, ringing from peak to peak of the summits over us, came a cry of such unutterable and ecstatic joy that it sounds down across the years and tingles among the cups on my quiet breakfast table. The end. Isn't that good? Charles Wesley, the great hymn writer. The last stanza, ooh. I love that hymn, Soar we now where Christ has led. Alleluia. Following our exalted head. How's it go? Alleluia. Made like Him, like Him we rise. Alleluia. Ours, I love this. Come on, come on. I just love this. Ours, the cross, the grave, the skies. Alleluia. So are we now where Christ is led. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that is the good news to the truth. He's alive. He is alive. Death, the great terminator, gone one day. And then shall come that moment in the rising when we shall meet. Don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. In Christ Jesus, we have this hope. But I need to end with an appeal. Can't end with just a good story. I wonder. You know, you have the gaping wound. You have the empty tomb. Apparently, heaven has made all the provision that is necessary to restore every human relationship that is humanly and divinely possible to restore. So here's the question. Is there a relationship you treasure? Is there a broken relationship that you, that you ache over? Would you be willing to submit yourself to the risen Christ tonight? And yield to him the prerogative to heal what is most precious to you. Oh, he'll have instructions for you. He will. You'll get it straight from him. Do whatever he tells you to do. But don't give up. Would you like to submit that relationship or those relationships to him right now? I would. I want to stand and say, by standing, Lord Jesus, have at it. Have at it. Restore this relationship that's broken. Restore what has been wounded and is gasping. Restore what feels dead. O living Christ, because you live, we shall live also. And that is a hope to carry with us into the last chapter of this life.
Let us pray. Oh God. Because I live, Jesus assures us. Because I live, you shall live also. He is the resurrection and the life. And so, Holy Father, we stand in the name of Christ, our Lord. We're not standing to commit ourselves to Him, not just now. We're standing because we, we who are standing have relationships that are precious to us yet. A runaway child that needs to be forgiven. A cruel, abusive parent that must be healed a spouse a family a church that rejected us long ago and the bitterness is so deep we still suffer oh god they are they are legion the relationships that are dear to our souls and so we stand you know the ones we're thinking of right now that relationship father please in the name of the lord jesus christ resurrect Resurrect the promise of new life. Restore what has been broken by the years. With us it's impossible, but we believe that with you it can be done. So whatever it takes, begin with me, but do what must be done. We want to go home healed. In the name of Jesus, our great healer, we thank you and we praise you, Father. Let all the people say, Amen, amen and Amen. You